in the latter days, we're going to get it. We're going to figure out how God has worked with the prophets. We're going to figure out the time frames. We're going to be able to go back into the ancient prophets and say, wow, that was a first coming prophecy. Wow, that's a second coming prophecy. Wow, that's an after the millennium prophecy. Is This is what God's going to do. He's going to pull back the veil. We're going to be able to dive into these prophets. We're going to be saying, okay, I know when this is going to happen. Okay, welcome. Let's let's roll, and we're gonna have some fun here tonight. Gonna make you work for your for your food tonight. That's for sure. Okay, well, let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you again this evening in need. First of all, we are in need of your grace and your covering. Cover our sins, Father. We thank you so much for the provision that you have given us in Yeshua, who took our place, our sentence upon himself, so that we could live and thrive. And Father, that qualifies us for your spirit. And we ask tonight uh, that you would give us your spirit freely, teach us your ways. And Father, teach us how you've put your word together so that we can understand it correctly. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Okay, uh, we are looking at prophecy. Now, you know, I've done quite a bit of thinking on the best way to do this. And, um, you know, they used to have they used to have in the Old Testament what they called the School of the Prophets. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there and listened to the prophets? Elisha was one of the, not Elijah, but Elisha was one of the teachers. And that would have been pretty good to be at that school. Um, but anyways, we're, we're studying the prophets to figure out how they put their messages together. And so what I thought was we could go back into uh, what Jeremiah wrote about what Daniel was studying. Daniel was studying in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to briefly look at that to pick up the context of the reason why we're going back to Jeremiah. But Daniel was studying um, Jeremiah, the books of Jeremiah. He tells us that in the first chapter. And he's studying specifically about the time frame that God said that they would be in Babylon in captivity and uh, he had come to the end of that time period and that's what either renewed his interest or made him study deeper into it we don't really know exactly but at the end of the 70 year period that was prophesied he was studying diligently into those prophecies of Jeremiah to figure out the timing that had come about and also the events that would transpire at the end of that. And that's what we, we've read that many times, several times, in 1 Peter, where he talks about 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, talks about the prophets search diligently as to the time of Yeshua's coming and the events that would be happening in the world at that time. We read that on Sabbath, I believe. And so this is what the prophets studied. A lot of people don't really see this, but the prophets were looking for the fulfillment of prophecy, and they went to the prophets that preceded them to find out what they had written, and the, the really the cool thing about it, when they studied, they were asking questions. It said they inquired. That's what Peter tells us. 
and then they got answers. So that the prophecies actually came alive to them and they got additional information. This is a lesson, this is a pattern and a lesson for us here at the time of the end when there are so many prophecies that speak about Yeshua's second coming. And so as we try and grapple with those prophecies, we, I believe, we will get additional information on the fulfillment of those prophecies just the same way the prophets did. And we're told here in the time of the end, in the last days, we see that in Acts chapter 2, that in the last days God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And young men, young maidens, old men, and uh, they would have dreams and visions, and they would get special understanding of these prophecies here at the time of the end. And that's what we're that's what we're searching for. We're trying to be a part of that latter day movement. Um, dare I say, la the movement of the latter day saints? Is that? Am I crossing the line there? I shouldn't cross. Yes. Um, okay. So we want to be part of that latter day saints movement, and uh, I hope everyone's following me there. Um, okay. So. We're going to go into Daniel chapter 9 and, and just pick up the context there. Then we're going to go back into Jeremiah and see exactly what Daniel was, was studying uh, as to the fulfillment of the time frame that Jeremiah was speaking. But the thing that we want to look at that, that I find most amazing is that within the 70-year uh, prophecy, Jeremiah goes into some, a lot of things that seem like they're going to happen right away after the 70 weeks, or 70 years, sorry. And this is what Daniel would have been trying to figure out. Like, what does all this mean? What's the time frame of all of this? These are some of the things you want to take yourself out of your position, put yourself in Daniel's position, and try and grapple with what Daniel would have been seeing in these prophecies. And then once we get out of Jeremiah, and this will probably be next week, we'll come back into what Jeremiah or what Daniel was told by Gabriel as to the fulfillment of, of Jeremiah's prophecies. And if we can grasp those concepts, it's going to be a lot easier for us to grapple with the prophecies in the time of the end because they're written in much the same way because God doesn't change. And if we can figure out how God gave prophecy and how we can see fulfillment of prophecy in times past, it gives us uh, a greater insight into how the prophecies are going to be fulfilled here in our time as well. Is that making any sense to anyone? Yeah. Is everyone frozen on the screen? No, they said yes. I they problem. said yes, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, great. So let's go up to, let's go to Daniel chapter 9 for our context. And then we're going to go back to Jeremiah and have a look at that. Okay, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, Judy, is it, is it practical to have them uh, read some text? Can we do that? Oh, absolutely. Okay, Judy's going to set up the mic so that we can pick it up, because uh, there's a fair amount of scripture we're going to have um, read tonight. So, uh, how about Les, would you like to read the first couple verses of chapter 9? of Daniel. Okay. In the first year of uh, uh, Darius, the son of uh, Azarias, uh, of the seed of the Medes, and of the, who was made the king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the number of years by books uh, which came uh, of the word of Jehovah to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplished 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay, so the time frame here is right at the end. 
it says here, in the first year of Darius. So that's after uh, Babylon had been taken uh, by Cyrus and Darius and uh, the uh, Belshazzar uh, lost his life that night when they take, took it. That's in chapter 5, I believe, of Daniel, where it talks about that, uh, that he had been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Daniel told him, this night your life will be required of you. So that's, that's happened just prior to this. Daniel is now completely focused because the 70 year period now is up. He is renewed interest back into what Jeremiah had said. And now he goes into Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, if we uh, look in verse 3, it says, uh, Then I set my face toward the Lord God and to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Now this is something that we just cannot miss, is the promise that God would be faithful to his people it's to those who love him and keep his commandments. That sounds kind of conditional, doesn't it? Those are covenant people. Those are God's covenant people that have made a covenant with him that they will obey him. And it's kind of like when Jacob was wrestling and he said, you know, if you will take care of me, uh, then I will return my tithe to you. It was a covenant that Jacob had made with the God of um, Isaac. And, uh, and so it's this covenant relationship that God has with the, those people. And this is the same covenant that Yeshua made with us before he left. He said that we need to go into all the world, teaching them to observe all all that I have commanded you. Well, this goes straight with what it says right here. Those who love him and keep his commandments. And of course, you guys know those words of Yeshua. If you love me, keep my commandments. So this is, this is all part and parcel of Yeshua's promise that he would be with us until the end. That's Matthew chapter 28, right at the end of the the chapter, he said, I will be with you to the end. The, the reason why he's going to be with us to the end is because we're going to be doing those things. We're going to be in <coughs> obedience to him, doing his commandments. And he knows that if we do that, we're going to be persecuted. And he, his promise was that he would be with us to the end of the age. And we, we are going to need his help all the way through. So we... We can put ourselves, in my mind, we can put ourselves right into this chapter of Daniel chapter 9 because nothing has changed. So we make confession to our great and awesome God who keeps his covenant. He will not break his covenant as long as we stay with him. There's no way um, that he will break his covenant. And we have those covenant promises as long as there's a sun and the moon in the heavens. As long as we're faithful to him, there is no way he will break his covenant with him. We have Yeshua's word on that. So this is kind of interesting because back here, I believe it's in Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Let's just go there. If we go to 2 Chronicles, this is the prayer of Solomon when he dedicated the temple. And you guys remember the story when the fire came down? Solomon had rebuilt the, or had built the temple, and then he dedicated it. And uh, very interesting here, it tells us that... I am in chapter 6, yes, chapter 6. It says here, in starting at verse 36, Daniel was being obedient. And in Daniel, in, 
2 Chronicles, Chronicles chapter 6, verse 36, it says here, When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and, let, and they take them captive to a land far or near, Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they have, were carried away captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned. Does this sound like what Daniel was doing? He was in the land of their captivity, came to his senses, and it says, when, uh, we have sinned and done wrong and have acted wickedly. And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have been carried captive, and pray toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, toward the city which you have chosen, and toward the temple which I have built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications, and maintain their cause and forgive your people. You have sinned or, or who have sinned against you. Now, my God, I pray, let your eyes be opened and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Okay, so this is what Daniel was doing. He was following uh, the instruction that Solomon had written down, and he was doing exactly what they were instructed to do. When they found themselves in captivity, they come to themselves, they make their prayer and supplication. Daniel was blessed all through, we know that, but at the end of the captivity, he renewed this and he had this prayer uh, God had this prayer recorded, and we can see. So through the whole prayer, he's making confession, not only for himself, he talks about his own sins, but he talks about the sins of the fathers, the sins of the, the priests, and uh, the royalty throughout this land. So he's making intercession for the whole house of Israel and for himself here as well. And then he goes, uh, verse 13, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before Jehovah our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand the truth. The interesting thing here, I find, is that turning from our, our, our iniquities and understanding the truth go hand in hand. It's this willingness to turn from our iniquities. And it's at that time that God will shed more light on things that we do not understand. So that's where we, we get to. And then he goes into um, verse 19. Uh, we'll just finish up in verse 19. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, listen and act, and do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Now in verse 20, it goes, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, now he's referring to Daniel chapter 7, that was the beginning vision that he had, being caused to fly swiftly, reach me about the time of the evening offering. Don't miss that point. At the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have, uh, I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So the question that I have, what has Gabriel come to give him understanding? Seems like a pretty basic question. Anybody want to take a stab at that? What has Gabriel come to give him understanding of? That first vision that he had? 
second vision? First vision? Uh, well, he's come to give him understanding of, of the vision, but what specific vision? Is it the first vision is his mere mention of the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen at the beginning? Was that just a, a note in passing? Or does that mean that he came to give him understanding of that specific vision? And the first vision that he had was Daniel chapter 7. So if we look at the subject matter of the understanding of the vision, then if we relate that to back to Daniel 7, and we won't take the time, but you can take the time to see that, it has nothing to do with the uh, vision of Daniel 7. There are, there are no similarities whatsoever, actually, of Daniel chapter 7. So it's got to be something else. So what else could it be? So it says in verse 2 that he was considering the numbers of the years of, of Jeremiah, the prophet, and then he set his face you know, toward the Lord God to make a request. So okay. it has to do with the captivity. Yeah, it has to do with the captivity and the prophecies of Jeremiah, because Jeremiah's prophecies have to do with the captivity and the return after the captivity. Jeremiah prophesied that they'd be 70 years in captivity, then they were going to go back to Israel at the end of the 70 years. Jeremiah was very clear that that's what would happen. And he also spoke about the Messiah that would come as well. And uh, that would all culminate after the 70-year period without any time frame. That's the thing that we really need to get a hold of, is he saw the 70 years, but there was no time frame to the coming of the Messiah. So now Daniel, very interesting, Daniel is given more time uh, understanding of Jeremiah's prophecies, Although Jeremiah never saw this time period, he just saw events after the 70-year uh, period. So now he goes on, he's going to give him understanding of the matter. Now, I don't know why Bible translators do this, but he's going to, he says, consider the matter and understand the vision. Well, that word matter there is the Hebrew word debar, not sure if that's exactly how to spell it or say it, but that's kind of how, how the English, uh, English form of it is. If we go back to what Daniel was studying about in verse uh, 2 of the same chapter, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the Debar of the Lord. That's the same word. So Daniel's studying the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah. This is what da Gabriel says that he's come to give him understanding with. Why the translators decided they needed to put in a different word here is beyond me. But it's, it should say, if we want to be consistent with how we started, it says, consider the word, the word what? The word of the Lord that's in verse 23, it could very well say, it should say, consider the word, the word of what? The word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet and understand the vision. So the vision Jeremiah had of the coming uh, of the Messiah at the end of the 70-year prophecy. Is this making any sense? We've got to make sure. Are there any questions up until this point? Okay, if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask because we want to want to kind of get rid of all the questions so we can move and we're all together. And I don't know how relevant it is, maybe not at all, but King James says, therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Understand and consider are the same Hebrew word. Okay, so they, so they did it to us again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why sometimes when you want to get into the finer details, it's nice to have a concordance or like uh, I really like to promote eSword because it's got, it's got the Hebrew and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, 
and it's very helpful, very helpful. So when you're trying to get into the nitty gritties, it's nice to have. So, so we see here, so if we're picking up the context, Daniel is studying Jeremiah. It's kind of like when Yeshua was up on the Mount of Olives and they said, um, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? He answered the question directly. And that's what we need to do. If you ask somebody a question regarding something, you're hoping that the answer they give you is in regard to the question that you asked. That, that makes sense, right? That's what we want. We want an answer to the question we asked. Daniel is studying the books of Jeremiah. Gabriel is sent from the throne of heaven to give him an answer to the question that he's grappling with, and it's the prophecies of Jeremiah. Specifically, the 70-year prophecy. We don't even need to guess. We're told which prophecy it is. So there are two chapters in Jeremiah that contain the 70 years, but there are multiple places where he speaks of the Messiah coming. And we're not going to look at all of those. Um, when I first got onto this track of Daniel, I spent months in Jeremiah trying to sort out all that Daniel was studying because Daniel did not have the book of Revelation. He didn't have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He was focused on all the prophets that had gone before him. And there wasn't a lot at that time. They didn't have the, any of the New Testament, of course. And they didn't have Malachi and some of these later prophets that came after Daniel. They didn't have the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and, and all these ones, because that was all last. So you figure out what he actually had. So he was kind of limited. We're in far better position than Daniel was. You know, just think about what that means. We are in a way better position as far as truth is concerned than Daniel was. So he was focused on the first coming of the Messiah. We are focused on the second coming of the Messiah. And so Daniel's now focused on the first coming of the Messiah, the unpacking of Jeremiah's prophecies, so that's the context. Let's go back. Okay, this is where I'm going to get you to help me do some reading here. Because we need to look at this really careful uh, and, and learn from those that have gone before us. Okay. We are uh, in Jeremiah chapter 25. All right. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt as we go. Um, and uh, if we have any questions along the way, we want to stop and answer those questions. If you see something that you feel is interesting, a comment you want to make, then let's hear it. Because I know full well that I am not the only one that the Spirit is working with tonight. So uh, we want to hear, we want to get some feedback as we go here. So I am looking at Jade as the next one on my screen after Les. Um, are you guys in the same frame as I am? Uh, no? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go by the order. And if you don't want to read, that's fine. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to go by the order that you guys, that I can see you up on the screen. So, um, so Jade, you want to take us through, let's go three verses. Okay. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the, all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Je Jehoiakim, the son of Jos Josiah and the king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people in Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third uh, year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you, rising early, and speaking, but you have not listened. 
Okay, good. Okay, there's got to be a comment in there. What do you see? What kind of jumps out at you there? I've got a couple things in my mind, but let's hear from you. Anyone? Well, it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Sounds like Jeremiah was a little frustrated. <laughs> why Why do you say that? Well, I've been speaking to you for 23 years and you haven't listened yet. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, I really like that. Um, yeah, do you suppose Jeremiah's story changed at all in 23 years? No. What what do you think his his uh, admonition would have been? Okay, come on, you guys. What do you think he's telling the people for twenty three years? Get your act together. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I I could have I could have said that a little more bluntly, but yeah, I think that's what he was telling them. Because well, I was trying to be nice. Yeah, I know you were. Yeah, I don't know if he said it that nicely, but um, yeah, absolutely. He's telling them that there that he could hear riders coming for twenty three years, and if you guys don't get your act together, the sword is coming on the land. And, and, of course, we knew this because he's talking about Josiah. So he knows some history. Josiah was a pretty good king. He did a lot of things. Josiah was the one that started up the temple services again, actually celebrated the Passover. That's in Chronicles. I forget where it is. Uh, maybe chapter 31 or something, somewhere in there. And he, he, I think he was the one that had the, all the bones of the false prophets dug up and he burned them on their altars and just really had a, a good time. And then Je Jehoiakim, his son, he's in total apostasy. So we, ha we go from a good king to a, um, the bad king. And in all of this time. And Jeremiah is trying to get them to come back online. And he does it. When you read the book of Jeremiah, and I really encourage you to, to read through the whole book of Jeremiah. It is so interesting how he tried to get the people to get back to God's law. He even had them, I forget which chapter it is now. He even had them, gonna, they were going to keep the seventh year. They were going to let their slaves go, all this kind of stuff. And they had decided they were going to do all that. And then they reneged on it. They, they actually made a covenant to do it. And then they reneged on it. And Jeremiah just let them have it. But anyways, very interesting. And it's not that we can look back and say, you know, those bad Israelites. But it's lessons. There, Jeremiah is full of lessons for us. It's just absolutely jam-packed for lessons for us. And so this is what he's doing here. And he says here, he says, They spoke to you rising up early in verse uh, 13, or verse 3, rising early and speaking, but we have not listened. Now keep your finger in there. We're going to go back to Daniel. And we want to look at something that it says in Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. I'm just going to have to find it here quickly. When I started looking at the verses of the prayer in Daniel chapter 9, I, I've got all through this uh, prayer in Daniel 9, cross-references. He's lifting verses in his prayer right out of the book of Jeremiah. And that's how I knew for sure. He is really focused on, uh, on the book of Jeremiah. So he goes, um, in verse 6, he says uh, in Daniel chapter 9, Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, 
who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and to our fathers and all the people of the land. And then he uh, goes down in verse 8. O Lord, to us belong shame of face to our kings, to our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. And then he goes on, verse 10, We have not obeyed your voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed uh, so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse written in the law uh, of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us, and we have sinned against him. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, we won't won't take any more time, but it's just he basically he's repeating himself and he's picking up on the concepts of Jeremiah where we have disobeyed uh, your servants, uh, the prophets in verse four, he says that again. And Jehovah has sent to all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. Okay. So let's, uh, let's pick it up now. Michael, would you pick it up there in verse 5? They said, repent now, everyone of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the lands that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods who serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Okay. So basically, in a nutshell, what is he saying to the people? There's two concepts there. If you will not worship other gods and do all the wrong things, then you can dwell in the land that I've given to your fathers forever. It's conditional, right? If they don't learn the lessons of obedience, they're not going to be in the land forever. That's simple. So the promise there by Jeremiah, there's good news and there's bad, bad news. If you repent and turn from your evil ways, then you will be able to dwell in the land. Okay, verse, uh, where are we? Verse 8? Okay, yep. Miriam? Yep. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, a hissing and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, and the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, and the light of the lamb. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Okay, great. So what we have here is the last call, if you will. This is Israel's last call before Nebuchadnezzar comes. So this, to me, he's been preaching this message, the same message, for 23 years. Now, if we go back to, I believe it was Hezekiah, Hezekiah was going to be, um, actually, Hezekiah got very sick. Do you remember that? He was very sick, and he wanted a sign. 
and he wanted a sign that God was going to heal him, and the sundial was turned back 10 degrees. Everyone remember that? That was around the year 700. So that was about 100 years before this. Not quite, but, you know, 90-ish, something like that. So Hezekiah was promised, uh, he repented, and he was promised that God would give him another 15 years of life. But with that promise came that Israel would be taken captive. They would suffer the penalty of disobedience. And this is exactly where they had got to. God extended their grace period, if you will, probation period, another 90 or so years, um, less than that, a little bit after Hezekiah had died. Uh, but the, the point being is God extended their probationary period, but they kept doing evil, um, and they just went from bad to worse, and now it had come to the end. But still, God, it looks like he could have changed everything had they repented. Because he said that, that verse 5, Repent now, everyone, of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers. So if they would have made, I think, if they would have made an abrupt turn and listened to, ne um, listened to Jeremiah, then God would have shielded them from ne Nebuchadnezzar. But we know the story. They obviously didn't. And then they were going to be in captivity for 70 years. Now, what do you make, Tom, of Nebuchadnezzar being called God's servant? He's a Babylonian pagan king. Well, that's God uses these people. And Nebuchadnezzar actually uh, became God's servant even with Daniel. And does that have any relevance today? Oh, I see where you're going with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because I've, I've said this before and I've taken heed over it. So I'll just say it again. You know, it's interesting in the book of Daniel. Daniel's a prophet for the time of the end. And people say, and I get this all the time, is that all politicians are evil and God cannot use them. They've all surrendered to the New World Order and every, every politician is evil. Well, I asked the question, was Nebuchadnezzar an evil king? I want some feedback here. Give me some feedback. Was Nebuchadnezzar an evil king? Hmm. Well, let me ask you this question. Was Nebuchadnezzar a pagan king? Yes. yes. Was Nebuchadnezzar obedient to the law of God. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar no. was a Sabbath keeper? Did he keep the Passover? No. 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 No, he was not. So it's probably very likely, we know this kind of some of the history, uh, according to the history books, these people, these kings, um, you look at them the wrong way and you get a death sentence. That's the way it was with these kings. Right. And so they were, they were pretty tough. They were pretty tough on their, uh, their customers. So I propose that these stories that are written by Daniel and some of these prophets, these kings that played out, are, it's going to be very parallel to the time that we're living in right now. I believe... And I could be wrong, but the way I'm reading these prophecies is we're going to have some deja vu when it comes to prophetic fulfillment. At the time of Daniel, Daniel was taken captive, and Daniel actually came into the graces, the good graces of Nebuchadnezzar, and rose to prominence in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Now, let me ask you this. Was Daniel, a politician. Did Daniel become a politician in the Nebuchadnezzar reign? Mm -hmm. There's only one answer for that question. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
I ask the question, is it possible that if God used a Daniel in the government of a pagan king, is it possible that he could ever do that again at the time of the end? Is that a possibility? Yes. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It has to be a possibility. God will use anyone he can that will hear his voice and follow his lead. Nebuchadnezzar had proved himself faithful, actually, to God. While he was unfaithful, God could see what Nebuchadnezzar could do under the influence of one of his faithful. We have something developing uh, presently in the world, is we have a man, and I'm just going to say this just because it's kind of funny, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, uh, was known to be the, the, the head of uh, the statue in Daniel's time. Daniel professed, he said, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Does anyone know in, uh, in times like these who would be a, a leader that would have a head of gold? Oh my, this is getting quite funny, isn't it? Okay, so, so here we go. This is, uh, this is Tom speculating at its best. There is a guy that is in the running to be vice president of the United States of America. And we all know who's in the running to be the president of the United States of America, who I believe will be the president of the United States of America. But one of the top... Uh, runners of being vice president is a fellow named uh, Ben Carson. And I don't know if you're familiar with Ben Carson, but I have met the man personally, and I've followed him through the years, watched him very closely. He is a Sabbath keeper, and he is a very, very dedicated Sabbath keeper. And he knows prophecy, not maybe quite as good as we know, but he knows the role of the papacy and how they're going to play out in the time of the end. And uh, he's enlightened, you might say, on, in that regard. And so if Donald Trump gets in office, he will play uh, a role in his government, as he had in his last government. So I'm looking very carefully at that. So uh, there's a lot of people that say that Ben Carson has sold himself out because he's, he's uh, worked in the government of, of Donald Trump. But I don't think God changes his ways, and he will use anyone he can. And if there are those in the halls of uh, Parliament or halls of Congress that God can use, he will use them to stay the evil course of evil empires. And I think we're looking at something very interesting as we move forward. Okay, so where did we get to? What verse did we get to? I think we got to... Did you read verse 12? No. No. Okay. Tom? Yes. Tom, um, you might not be one to go here, but this what section we just read is almost verse uh, word for word out of revelation 18 you, you know that right um, with the basically about the great city babylon and judgment on her in the end and, and in this case he's using babylon as a instrument to judge his people exactly exactly so god will use again Babylon, and we can see this, and that th you've you've just opened up a, a road that we could go down. I don't know if we want to go down there right now, because uh, yeah. that that could be a bit of a longer road. But that's a very good insight there. Yeah, God does. God works the same way all the time. He used an evil king at that time, and uh, to bring judgment on Israel. And he's going to use Babylon again, only this time in the form of the harlot, 
uh, to bring judgment. It says in Daniel 9, or Daniel chapter 8, and I believe I read this on Sabbath, that in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, let's just go there because that's, I think we should, now that you've opened that up, uh, Dan, that's uh, interesting. Uh, Where are we insight. going? Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 speaks of a little horn, and we're, we're going to be making connections, not today, but we are uh, the time of the Gentiles that we've been talking about on Sabbath. Um, this crosses over into that, the time of the Gentiles, and it says here that this little horn power persecutes God's people, but it's interesting, when the little horn power comes in, it's when the transgressors have reached their fullness. And this is exactly the same pattern we see back in Daniel, in Daniel's time, when Jeremiah was preaching, the transgressors in Israel had reached their fullness, and lo and behold, the king of Babylon came in and uh, pronounced judgment on them. So God used Babylon to bring judgment upon God's people, to bring the sword upon the land. This is exactly what's going to happen in the time of the end, is when the kingdoms of the world have reached their fullness in transgression. It says here in verse 23 of Daniel chapter 8, and in the latter time of their kingdom, that's the four kingdoms, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully. He shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his hand he shall magnify himself in his heart he shall destroy many in their prosperity he shall even uh, rise against the prince of princes he shall be broken without human hand so this is the time that we're looking at in the future when sin and sinners are at their height. God gives them over to this king. And as we get into Revelation, we can see that that king, this little horn, is none other than the harlot of Revelation. Uh, and it's called Babylon the Great. So that's, that's uh, very good. Very good. Thank you, Dan, for, for going there. Uh, okay. Let's go back to 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, and uh, we are in verse 12. So I am looking at Sherry, you're the next person in my screen. So if you want to okay. read a few verses there. Okay. So this is yeah. at the end of the 70 years now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland forever, and I will bring upon them all the tears I have promised in this book, all the penalties announced by Jeremiah against the nations. Many nations and great kings will enslave the Babylonians just as they enslaved my people. I will punish them in proportion to the suffering they cause my people. Wow. Okay. So now Daniel has come to the end of the 70-year period, and he's looking for fulfillment of this promise. Right? So we here are at another time in Earth's history, and we're reading prophecies that we can see now, as we're reading them, we can see how they can be fulfilled in our day. We're looking at the time frame of their fulfillment, and we're also looking at the events that would be transpiring in the world at that time. Well, it's interesting that Daniel is told that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and do this. So wouldn't it be consistent with our father 
that he would tell us which kings are coming beforehand? Sure. They yes, knew sir. well in advance the kingdoms of the world that would be involved. In fact, in the 45th chapter of Isaiah, I think it names Cyrus by name, actually names, calls him his servant, Cyrus, would come in and uh, execute judgment on Babylon, and we see that ahead of time. So why would we expect anything different here at the end of time? Wouldn't God reveal the kings that are going to be involved in the events that are happening at the time of the end? I propose he does. We can know who they are. There's enough evidence in the word that we can know who these kings are uh, that are going to be on the stage in the time of the end. If God knew in advance back then, he obviously has shown us he knows in advance uh, at this time as well. Okay, so let's, uh, anything else, anyone else want to bring a comment out of those verses? Other than uh, the nations uh, that Babylon would, would be uh, given back what they had given. Now, because Dan, you opened that, that can, we're going to go there because this is, this is uh, quite interesting here. Turn to Revelation chapter 18. So we just read that God is going to repay Babylon for what they had done against God's people. And uh, right here in, um, well, let's read a few verses here because this is kind of interesting. Let's start in verse uh, 1 of chapter 18. Um, Rob, do you want to pick that up? And, um, yes, sir. Okay. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine, and of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she hath in her heart, I set a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no more sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Okay. And the kings of the earth. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, sure. Why and the not? kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off from the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil 
and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and the fruit of thy soul lusteth after or departed from thee and all things which were dainty and godly or goodly or departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all. Okay. The merchants of thee. Okay, that's, that's good. We get the point there. Um, that's good. Thank you. Um, so we can see here that, and this is a promise, as surely as God judged Babylon of old, he <laughs> will judge Babylon of the future. Um, and Babylon is alive and well today, and they're going to be doing all of this stuff that it talks about here. But these prophecies are actually promises because when we're being persecuted by Babylon of today, uh, we're going to know that her judgment is coming. And we actually know how long it's going to take through these prophecies that her judgment will come. And that's, that's the, the interesting part is God has told us how long we're going to have to endure and when we're going to be delivered. That's exactly the same thing in keeping with the, the prophecies of old as well. All right. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter um, 25 again. So God has now promised that after 70 years, God will judge Babylon. And he did it through Cyrus. And he did it through... Uh, through Darius, so they came and uh, uh, Belshazzar was slain, it tells us in chapter 5, that same night, and they pronounced judgment on, on Babylon. And he did it with other kings of the earth, and this is what we see in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17, it's the ten kings who destroy the harlot, uh, that being Babylon the great. And so we see God is going to use the same, same sort of way to bring judgment on the harlot as he brought judgment on Babylon of old. He works the same way. Okay, what verse are we on now? Fifteen. Fifteen, okay, who is... Um, okay, is that Arlene? Oh, okay, Arlene, you were late today. You got a mark by your name. You were late, so... Um, anyway. I know. <laughs> All right. I'm here now. Ready to read. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm not going to give you uh, a late mark because I know you're probably working hard and trying to get everything done. So that's good. That's a given. Well, thank you very much, teacher. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink, unto whom the Lord had sent me. Okay. We got to stop. We got to stop right there. So we've just shifted gears. Did you notice that right here? Did, did God, did all the nations drink? What does it say here? It says, take this wine cup of my fury from my hand and cause all nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger... What what's going on? Why are you staggering after you drink? Because they're drunk. They're drunk. Nice. Absolutely. So they are drunk. It says stagger. Uh, you will drink and stagger and go mad. So they're they're like really drunk. They've gone crazy um, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all nations drink to whom the Lord had sent me. Okay. 
So let's go up to Revelation 17. See some very, very close similarities here. Revelation 17, 1 to 3. Then one of the seven angels whom I had seen, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. This is Babylon the Great now. If you go up to verse 5, it says, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here we have the identity of this harlot at the end. It's sitting on this beast that's made up of uh, t seven heads and ten horns. And of course, we've looked at that before. That's Revelation 13. Uh, Revelation 12 and Revelation 13, the, uh, the beast that's made up of all these different kings, she rides all these kings. She holds the reins of these kings in her hand. And she has made all nations drink. Why has she done that? We saw in Daniel chapter 8 that God sends or allows this king to come at the time of the end because the world is in full-on transgression and sin, and he allows this beast to come and take control through the, the Babylon the Great. But she's going to get her just reward as well, the same way as ancient Babylon uh, got its just reward at the end of its reign. But the interesting part, we've seen a shift here, and we're going to notice that, uh, let's let's pick up this shift here, and um, if something comes to your mind, I want you to stop as we read. I'm not going to stop uh, until we read uh, down to verse, say, 30. But if you see something here that you want to bring out in these next few verses, let's hear about it. Okay, Arlene, how far did you get? Um, to 18. 18, okay. Okay, verse 19. Who wants to pick it up? Uh, Anthony, verse 19, and read a... What chapter? Uh, 25 of Jeremiah. Je oh, Jeremiah, okay, sure. Um, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his servants, and his princes, and all his people, and all the, all, all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of... Who's... Uh, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkenon and Azon and Ekron and the remnant of Ashdod, <clears throat> excuse me, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon and all the kings of Tyrus and all the kings of Zidon and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Gedan and Tema and Booz, and all that are in their utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and all the kings of Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the kings of Shishak shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at, at thine hand to drink, that thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil 
on the city which is called by my name and should be ye utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon the inhabitants of the earth. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Okay. Howl ye shepherds. Okay. That's, um, let's stop there and catch a breath. Um, so. Okay, now put yourself in Daniel's shoes, reading that. What is he thinking? Total destruction, almost. Total destruction? When, though? That hasn't even happened yet. <laughs> no, not total destruction, but a lot of really bad stuff going on, I guess. Well, total destruction. This says the slain of the Lord will sh shall be from one end of oh. the earth even to the other end of the earth. So is this a, a second coming or a third coming picture? Well, you tell, you tell me. How does it read? Let's read it for what it says. It, it seems like a third coming picture. Um, and it said something about treading the grapes as well, um, which I always see as a, as a picture of the final wrath of God, the wine press. Okay, let's let's um, let's go to Revelation nineteen. Let's go to Revelation nineteen. Pick it up at um, verse eleven. Who's next? Um, well, Michael, you're next on my screen, but. Back to Michael again. I think we've gone through the list. <laughs> okay, let's it's read. Fine. Let's read. Um, yeah, we want to take a good section here, but read four or five verses. Read to 15 right. from 11, starting at 11. So we, we're talking about Revelation 19, are we? Revelation 19, 11. verse 11, yeah. Yeah, sure. Christ on a white horse. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame or fire and on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew expect himself he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself would, will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself frets the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The beast and his army is defeated. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice 
saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, and that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him, who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay. That to me, um, and, and just to comment on Dan, there's going to be another destruction at the end of the millennium that the whole, all the wicked will be resurrected. It's called the second resurrection at the end of the millennium. And then it'll be at that time they're destroyed. But I'm thinking that this, what we read in Jeremiah, is actually reads very much like chapter 19 of Revelation. It says, if we go back to Jeremiah, it says, um, the Lord in Jeremiah verse, uh, or chapter 25, verse 30, prophesy against them all these words and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high. He will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. So this is interesting, and then it drops down. A noise will come from the ends of the earth, for Jehovah has a controversy with, his na with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. That's what Yeshua said prior to his second coming. He said, when the gospel of the kingdom goes to all the world, then the end will come. That's the pleading with all flesh. That's where we come in, is we give this message to the world that the prophecies of not only Daniel are going to be fulfilled, but Jeremiah's prophecy here in 25 will be fulfilled, as well as paralleling that with Revelation chapter 19. So Jeremiah's command here by God was to go to all the nations, prophesy against them all these words. So we're our, part of our prophesying is to warn all nations that the Lord is going to roar from on high. And that's the King of Kings that we read about. So we've got other witnesses, if you will, in some of these other prophecies. So the main point, the reason why we wanted to read this in Jeremiah is what I found very interesting is that the second coming prophecy from the time that this Jeremiah had that, this is like 605 or 6 uh, BC, that has never been fulfilled, wasn't fulfilled at the first coming of the Messiah, but will be fulfilled at the second coming of the Messiah. So my question is, how would have Daniel read this and made sense of it? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm asking. <clears throat> Would Daniel have thought that all of this was going to happen? He knew that the Messiah was coming. That was a given. There's all kinds of places in the prophets that came before. Daniel knew the Messiah was coming. He was told in, in Jeremiah that it would be 490 years. We haven't got into that, but we're looking at that. 
In Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel comes and says it's going to be 490 years. You're supposed to repent. You're supposed to do all this stuff. The Messiah is going to come. And so now he's reading in Jeremiah. I have to ask the question, was Jeremiah thinking that the, when Messiah would come, he would do this? Was, Daniel thinking or was, Jeremiah thinking? was Jeremiah thinking when the Messiah came, because Jeremiah was prophesying at the end of the 70 years, and then he gets into the judgments that were going to happen, no indication of how long it would be before the Lord would roar from on high. It's just the promise that's given. Are you with me? This is critical when we're looking at ancient prophecies, is there is no time frame. So how do we know the when of it all? Hence, we have all kinds of people today that are prophesying, and I saw today again, I watched a little short clip on somebody that was prophesying of fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and I'm just shaking my head. It's like, how do we do what we're doing? We have no clue. Well, it's interesting. At the time of Jeremiah, he was squaring off against the false prophets of the house of Israel. Wow. Deja vu. Where have we seen this before? We have here, at the time of the end, we have exactly the same thing going on. We have multitudes of false prophets, and we have very few of true, true prophets. That's kind of scary. I don't know about you, but I'm not really comfortable with the picture that I'm seeing out there today with all the crazy stories that I'm hearing about prophecy. So my point is, unless we see how God has worked in the past with the prophets and how things beca became fulfilled, we won't get the prophecies that are being fulfilled in our day. We're going to get all mixed up on them. And that's why God has promised that God's people will be keeping the commandments. Let's read it. Let's read it. Um, in Revelation chapter 12. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of uh, went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Well, let's flip over to Revelation chapter 19. Verse um, 10. Yeah. I think I'm looking at Revelation 19, verse 10. Just where we were reading. I fell at his feet. Uh, John falls at the feet of this being. And he says, uh, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yeshua. Just what we read about in Revelation chapter 12. The testimony, worship God for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. I am a firm believer that unless the spirit of prophecy helps us understand the prophets, what they wrote, we're going to get them mixed up 100% of the time because they are not clear. The time frame is not clear. And unless the prophet or the spirit of prophecy that inspired the prophets, that gave the prophecies, is going to work with us and help us to understand the time frame of these prophecies, we will get them wrong all the time. This is where the Israelites got it wrong. They were saying, you know, these people that don't know the law, 
You guys remember that? In John, I think it's chapter 8, somewhere in there, where the Pharisees were saying, you know, these, these people that don't know the law, they're cursed. They don't know how to interpret the prophecies. We're seeing exactly the same thing uh, today. We're seeing the same thing played out. Unless the spirit of prophecy is inspiring us, we're going to get it wrong, and we need the spirit. Uh, so, here I, I ask again, do you think that Jeremiah understood the time frame from the going forth here of the 70-year uh, prophecy and the ultimate destruction at the coming of Yeshua? What do you think? I'm open to entertaining ideas here. I think they would have thought um, that it could happen after they uh, got cleared from Babylon. At least sometime after. Um, yeah, I rather suspect he wasn't thinking 2,700 years later. No. I can't see no. that. I definitely no, really, can't no. see that. And we know that. We know that. Let's go up to the book of Matthew. I believe it's in Matthew. We have another prophet. And his name is John. And he's preaching. He's preaching his heart out. In verse... Let's pick up some context here. Um, chapter 3, verse 1, 2, and yeah, 1 through 3. You said Matthew or John? Matthew. Yeah, I said John, but it's John the Baptist. Okay. So this is a prophet that's studying the Old Testament. He's studying Jeremiah. He's studying Isaiah. He's looking for the promised Messiah coming. This is what he was preaching. So, who? Irene. Irene, it's your turn. Would you like to read for us? Read verse 1 through 3 of Matthew chapter 3. I'm trying to get, trying to, get to Matthew 3. Okay. Just a minute here. I was looking at something else. Wasn't paying attention. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a mark on your name. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 3, 1. 1 through 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through now, 3. Now, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the deserted places of Judea and saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. What 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 what, is, oh, whoa, whoa. what did he just say? For the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. You don't suppose he's thinking of the kingdom being restored when he's saying this? Yes. Let's let's follow <laughs> let's follow what he's saying here. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. For this he spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of, Yahush uh, of Yahweh, make smooth his path. Okay. And so, John himself had his clothing from hair out of a camel and the belt leather about his loin, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Okay, so let's drop up to um, verse 8. Oh, let's back up. Verse 7. Yeah, we shouldn't probably miss any of it. Uh, Dale, you want to pick up on verse 7 and read through sure. to 12. Sure. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Okay, stop right there. It, did did we see the wrath that was to come at the first coming? Or was John speaking of the wrath that come that he saw in, in Isaiah? Which was the second coming. 
Or Jeremiah, right? Right. Well, he would have had access to that. He was reading it all. Yeah. It's just, it identifies him as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And that's actually in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, it refers to John the Baptist in Malachi chapter 3, a messenger of the Lord, um, preparing the way before the Messiah. Also in Isaiah. So all that's doing, it's not saying, and I know that's not what you're saying, but just for clarity's sake, um, we're not saying here that John was only reading the book of Isaiah. Isaiah pinpoints John as the one, the forerunner of the Messiah. But John would have been reading it all. He would have been reading Jeremiah. He would have been reading all those prophets that spoke about the coming of the Messiah. So he's saying, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he's reading in the ancient prophets of God's wrath that was going to be poured out. Exactly the same wrath that we read about in Jeremiah. So let's uh, keep going. Verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that if Yah is able to able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but that but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy, with the Kadosh Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garden, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Yeah, that's that's good. Okay, <laughs> so so here we have the same thing going on. We've got a prophet prophesying in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, saying the 70 years are up, and he prophesies of the Messiah coming. And then with that comes, the Lord will descend from his holy habitation and lay everything waste. The, they will be slain from one end of the earth to the other. That's what, that's what John was reading. And that's exactly what he was preaching. Well, wasn't John prophesying there the kingdom of heaven is drawn near? Was he not talking about Yahushua? Yes. Yes, he was. But he was also talking about, in verse 12, it says, His winnowing fan, that's speaking of Yeshua now, Yeshua's winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire this this didn't happen now this happened in a sense at the destruction of Jerusalem but this is not what John was talking about John was talking about the ultimate destruction of evil and so my point is, is the prophets, when they read, they didn't have all the information. They didn't have the time frames. They had the information. They just didn't understand the time frame as we do today. We've got additional time prophecies. And as we look out in the world, we can start to put those time prophecies where they belong because God is going to pull back the curtain, if you will. I want us to go back into um, Jeremiah again. Is that why he told Daniel to close up the book? Yes, exactly. We would, we, would, we would be revealed when the time got closer for us to understand? Exactly, exactly. Even Jeremiah didn't understand some of the things that he prophesied. He saw the events. 
but he did, couldn't grasp the time frame. John comes along. He's preaching exactly the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. That's exactly what Jeremiah was teaching. He said, if you would repent, then you would go back to the land that I gave to their fathers forever. That's the kingdom. Promise, right there. So they're all teaching. We should be teaching the same thing. If we're, we should be echoing the words of the prophets. And so, so if we have the spirit in us, then we should be able to look at these prophecies and fit the time frame into these prophecies exactly. today. Exactly. Exactly. And we're told that we will, because we're told in the end of the book of Daniel, the wise shall understand. What are the wise going to understand? Daniel chapter 12 is where that is given. And we have three time periods given in Daniel chapter 12. What are they going to understand? Well, they're going to understand the events and the time frame. So we have the promise that if we will do this. Now, in it will finish up on this verse. I mean, there's so much more we could say and read, um, but we've been just given a little bit of glimpse here. There's a verse here um, in verse 20. I'm just wondering how far back we should go. Um, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 30 now. Okay. The things that we would be understanding from we would have to go back into the bible into the prophecies themselves to get it it's not these new false prophets that are exactly exactly things. that's exactly it's, we've got to go back to the word and get and it from the word new is going to be, nothing new is going to be prophesied it's just that we're going to uh, the prophecies already given will be understood better right we don't need additional information as much as we need understanding of the information that's already been given. Right. And that's why we need the spirit of prophecy that inspired the prophets who wrote the words down. We need that same spirit uh, to, to help us understand. Now, I want to look at something else that's kind of interesting. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 23. Speaking of the same final destruction. You're muted. I'm muted? Mm -hmm. I think. We can't hear you. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Did I turn, did I shut that off? Oh, oh there you now, go. now you're, you're now you're back. Okay. Now you're back. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, might have been the internet, actually, that, that did something, because I think I saw a note come across there. Okay, so we have the same, same thing going on in Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's full of it. Isaiah's full of it all over the place. In fact, Isaiah chapter 65 is the most confused, um, the confused chapter in all of mess the Messianic movement. It's completely messed up, and it's because of the time frame. It's a misunderstanding of the time frame. Uh, that's Isaiah chapter 65. You want, might want to read that. That would be a good study uh, another time. It's a good example of a messed up interpretation of, of prophecy in the Messianic movement. Yeah, and we have done a teaching. Do we have one? Does it say Isaiah 65 somewhere? Okay, so we have a teaching on that if you're interested. Um, okay, Isaiah or Jeremiah chapter 30. We'll finish up on this and then we'll have some discussion and we'll let you go. Uh, 23. Kathleen, you want to read us two verses here, 23 and 24. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. A continuing whirlwind, it will fall violently on the head of the wicked. It's second coming now. This is exactly what we've been reading about. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it. And until he has performed the intents of his heart. 
in the latter days you will consider it. Oh, isn't that interesting? Well, mine mm-hmm. says understand it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's that same word in Daniel. Consider the vision and understand, or under, or consider the matter and understand the vision. It's exactly right. In the latter days, we're going to get it. We're going to figure out how God has worked with the prophets. He's, we're going to figure out the time frames. We're going to be able to go back into the ancient prophets and say, wow, that was a first coming prophecy. Wow, that's a second coming prophecy. Wow, that's a, after the millennium prophecy is this is what God's going to do. He's going to pull back the veil. We're going to be able to dive into these prophets. We're going to be saying, okay, I know when this is going to happen. And it's nothing that we have got smart enough to do. It's humbling ourselves enough to let God do the work and show us the way. So I'd like to finish up there. Maybe let's close with prayer. If, there's, if we have any discussion, we can discuss uh, whatever we want for a few minutes, and then we'll let you go. Let's, uh, Les, would you like to close uh, with a prayer? Okay. Father in heaven, our great God, we come before your throne, and we just thank you for this, this study that we've had here today and this evening, and we just thank you for... It's your word that we can glean your truth from it and getting more understanding all the time. And we thank you for that. We thank you for just uh, inspiring Tom to also teach us and and also just to help us to to learn. And so we thank you. We just ask for your dismissal here as well. We just thank you and praise you and in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Amen.